What do you think the deadliest cat of all the cats is? You may think it's like a lion. You might think it's a tiger. I mean, they eat large prey and they seem like they're very adept hunters. But it's actually this sand cat. It's a little sand cat that lives in the desert and it never gets much bigger than a house cat. And it's so cute. Look at its little face. I just want to. It has a success rate during hunts of 60%, which is higher than tigers, lions, and leopards. Oh my. So it is the deadliest cat that we know of. We put little, little collars on them and, and their little faces and their fur kind of puffs up underneath the. I just want to love it. I don't know what, the, what's the, there should be a name for the reflex, the cute kill reflex. It's like, wow, that's adorable. I want to eat it until it's dead. Cute aggression, yeah. Look at your little face, I'm gonna, oh! Welcome to another episode of Because Science Footnotes, the show where I take your comments, questions, and corrections that you leave everywhere around this channel and all the stuff that we get up to, and on the last episode in canon, and I tackle them head on, which is a, we should stop saying that because head on tackling is A, illegal now, and B, you're just asking for a brain injury. You should tackle it shoulder on around the center of mass. Not quite as pithy. So on the last episode of Because Science, I wanted to know how long you would actually have to live in Termina if you were Link in the classic game Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. I wanted to know, astrophysically speaking, if a moon was falling from orbit down to the surface of a planet, how long would it actually take? Now I know some videos have used in-game values for the size of the moon and how far it was away, but I used our moon and our Earth and I found that it would fall from orbit to the surface of Earth in just a little under five days, which is so close to three days that it's awesome, at least to this guy with a thumb. But what did you have to say? So our first comment comes from Lil Bear Claw and Ruyman90 who say something about, well, I could have been exactly correct about timing because as you play Majora's Mask, you find out that the townspeople in the town that's gonna get smashed by the falling moon are already aware that the moon is falling. So let's say that the moon had been falling for 1.8 days and then you show up inside the game. Then it could be exactly three days until it hits the surface of the planet. I like that answer because because it makes what I said correct. Heh. But I also don't like it because you can say it for any time value, right? If it took 25 days for the moon to fall, according to our math, and you could just say that Link was wandering around before he got to Termina for 22 days, and by the time he showed up, then it would be three days time. I wanted to go for the pure mathematical answer. And in my interpretation of the game when I was playing it as a kid, no matter what the townspeople say, I thought that the moon only really started to fall when uh, Skull Kid activates it at the top of the clock tower uh, in your first playthrough before you use the Song of Time. I was like, hey! <laughs> like that. I thought that's when it really started to fall. Um, but I guess that's only when it was about to fully crash. And it was stopped? <sighs> Gets a lot more complicated. So, nice. Thank you. O opposed to doing it another way, what I'm trying to do with videos like this is not calculate the exact what should it be in the game. I'm trying to work backwards and take things that we love in pop culture and find interesting tidbits of science within them. Now, if you use exact pixel perfect values in Majora's Mask, you might find something different, but then I think you don't actually get to some of the more interesting stuff that you could, like Kepler and smart boy Isaac Newton and all those things, and, and Kepler's third law and orbital mechanics and stuff. So yes, it could get a lot more complicated as we're, as we're about to find out. Our second comment comes from El Mactans and TF Chronicleur, who say uh, some variation of wouldn't the moon get completely destroyed by Earth's gravity before hitting the surface? So in my episode about Thanos throwing a moon, I introduced the concept of the Roche limit, and that's how close an orbiting body can get to a larger body with a lot of gravity before the gravitational forces exceed the gravitational attraction that body has that holds it together, and it will start to be ripped apart by the gravity of the larger body. That's what happens around 
around some of our planets that have rings where bodies can get caught and fall into the Roche limit and then be slowly torn apart and form rings. That would indeed happen as the moon got closer to the surface of the planet, if it's Earth or whatever termina is on. But from what I understand, the Roche limit acts to disintegrate orbiting bodies very slowly. We're talking about time scale of thousands of years, not days. So yes, the moon, if it stayed in orbit around the planet and it was very, very close to the surface, it would start to break apart probably, but very slowly. Because we're talking about an impact in a matter of days, I don't think that is actually going to be a very important factor. There will be other things that are more bad for you, as we will see. TF Chronicler also said, by the way, Game Theory did it first. Love you. Well, the feelings one way from you to me. Ban them! Ban them for life and give me their address! I'm gonna chronicle your destruction at my hands. Our next comment comes from Karen Attridge, who says, I wish I had some smart comment to leave to qualify as a super nerd. Well, <laughs> maybe one day. That's right, maybe one day, Karen, keep trying. Our next comment comes from Bane's car. Now, I bet it's Bane Scar. But what if it was Bane's car? He would drive the, the Royd Mobile. We call it Royd Rage. Bruce, check out my Royd Royce. It had, it had two gas tanks, circular in shape, but since the Royd Rage started, they're smaller now. <laughs> anyway, Bane's car says, after your last footnotes episode where you mentioned this episode that I'm talking about, Majora's Mask, I tried this scenario, our moon hitting the Earth in Universe Sandbox 2, but it took 5.08 days. Why is this different from what you calculated? Well, I actually mentioned Universe Sandbox 2 in this Majora's Mask video. It's a really, really cool, scientifically accurate space simulator game where you can create your own orbits for all the planets. You can throw different objects at light speed into other stuff to see what would actually happen. And uh, when Bane's car, yes, did it, they found that it took 5.1 days for the moon to fall to Earth. I said it took 4.8. Now, I imagine the difference, Bane's car, yes. is because um, I'm using an estimation with Kepler's third law. Uh, like I said, this would take really complicated math. So I don't, because the acceleration is changing constantly with position and, and time. So I'm guessing that Universe Sandbox 2 actually goes through all the complicated math and is more precise, or maybe it's starting with different variables, and or I don't know what it's doing, and it would have to do with the coding, so it could be different. But think of it this way, 4.8 and 5.1 are pretty dang close in terms of percentage, so it's not way off, which means our estimation, if Universe Sandbox 2 is correct, is pretty good. Send me a Steam key. I have a Steam key for Universe Sandbox 2, at my desk from Vsauce's Curiosity Box, but it won't redeem. Thanks, guys. I think I let the Steam key expire, but I didn't think they expired. It's my bad. But the best comment at the time of this filming, I gotta give to Giggity Guy, who says, well, of course, you would probably die of a myriad of other causes before impact itself. If you were directly under the moon as it fell, the gravitational effects of it approaching would go stronger and stronger as the moon, the planet, and everything on them are drawn towards the very center, which is moving closer and closer to the surface of the planet as the moon falls. The most obvious way you would die is drowning since Termina is surrounded by the Great Bay on at least three sides, and tides would rise massively as the moon approached. Speaking of tides, it's possible that you might start experiencing tidal forces inside your own body, and finally, you would be killed just slightly before impact as the falling moon compresses the atmosphere in front of it, flattening you and everything around you, as well as heating up everything in this path of thousands of degrees. Small comfort to you, I'm sure, but at least you don't have to experience getting squished by the moon itself. <sighs> you are indeed a super nerd. Wow! Gee. I don't have to explain much into that. That's just a really good comment. But of course, I'm not always right, and this week is no different. In fact, because you have to make a lot of assumptions to make something like video game physics from 20 years ago make sense, there's a lot of corrections this week, so let's see if we can straighten it out into an elliptical line with the eccentricity of one, which is a line. It's a bad math joke. All right, so our first correction comes from a lot of people who are all saying that, hey, you used half the orbital time that you found from Kepler's third law to calculate impact time. Shouldn't you be using a quarter? Everyone is saying this, and I think this is what you all mean, that if you had the Earth 
here at the center of a kind of circular orbit that if you go around to the other side, that's half. So if you wanted to impact, wouldn't you only have to go a quarter of that? No. I think the confusion here is that when we have an eccentricity of one for this orbit, we are flattening this orbit into literally a line. And when you have a line, imagine a very, very squashed circle. The line, the time to orbit once, will be more or less straight towards the Earth, make a hairpin turn around the Earth, and go back. That's an orbital period of one. But these are actual things in our examples. They're not just points of math. If these are two bodies with a lot of mass, by the time it reaches half of the orbital time, when it's supposed to make the hairpin turn around the Earth, it will smash into the Earth. That is why you need half of the orbital time. We're not going like this around it, so it can't be a fourth or whatever I think you mean. We are going straight towards it, and if we're going straight towards it and back, and that equals one, then half that distance will be impact. I hope that makes it more clear. I need a mini solar system. I actually have one, but I'll be getting, well, it's not, I'll get to it. Our next biggest correction, two big corrections this week, come from another lot of people who say that if the moon was stopped in orbit, wouldn't it miss the Earth or Termina if it was following a straight line? Or they say, wouldn't the position of the moon change? Yes. Now, th this is where a lot of the complicated game mechanics come in, and there are a lot of contradictory information, and I think you'll understand why I did what I did. So if the moon was orbiting the Earth, what I'm saying is that if the moon stopped, it would fall in a straight line down towards Earth. But what I did not say is that as the moon is stopped, it can still be going around the sun like this. You know, It's just stopped in its orbit around the Earth. What I did not say is that the Earth keeps spinning. The Earth is spinning quite quickly, so as the moon is coming down for impact, the Earth is spinning, and so it should appear from the surface of the Earth that the moon is still moving across the sky, even though, relatively speaking, it is heading straight towards it. That is correct. Then it might not hit Termina, and the moon should change position in the game, but it doesn't look like it changes position. So you're correct, and so in our example, in our math, the moon would now have to be geosynchronous, synced up like a satellite, synced up with the rotation of the Earth, so it's going around the Earth at the same speed that geosynchronous satellites do, but if something the size of the moon did that, it would be going so fast it would be flung out of orbit and into space like some crazy weapon of mass destruction, so that doesn't work, but the sun still goes around Termina in the game. There's still a day and night cycle, which implies that the planet is still spinning, but the moon is locked in right there, and you always see the same face, so it's both tidally locked and geosynchronous. Okay, so it should be geosynchronous to stay in the same place, but it can't be because it would be flung off into space. But the Earth is still spinning without it because the sun is moving. So, take your pick. The really hard part with analyses like these is that you kind of have to pick and choose what you want to go with. I do this with lightsabers all the time. You, you pick some interesting line of reasoning and you follow it to some fun conclusion. That's what we're doing here. I know that the moon would have to be in geosynchronous orbit, but it can't be. But the sun is still moving in the background, implying that the earth is still spinning. The earth didn't get stopped. Or uh, you could stop the earth with the same Skull Kid powers, but it can't because the sun is still... So you see the problem here? You kind of have to pick and choose what you want to go with. What I did is a pure analysis of what would happen if the moon stopped in its orbit and fell straight down towards a large point mass. That's all I wanted to get across. If you want to make it more complicated, you can. And let me know your best idea in the comments. Our next correction comes from John Faria, who says, I would like to point out that your diagram and intact almost, and intact almost every diagram we have ever seen of a planet's and their moons are totally off. Your moon is maybe one to two moons away from its planet. In fact, our moon and almost every moon is really far away. That's right, John. I did not include the little not to scale asterisk in my drawings. Uh, I should have. Why every diagram you've ever seen is usually not to scale, 
I'm going to guess it's never to scale, is because it's hard to show things both visually and accurately when you're dealing with something as expansive as space. If I had the Earth here, it would be basketball size, and the moon would be tennis ball sized, and usually you'd see it about this close in a frame such as this. But how far would that moon actually have to be from the Earth? It would have to be 24 feet in that direction away, which is just, for something like this, really hard to show. Jeez, jeez. That's why we don't do that. Someone will just throw a moon at you. Thanks, Thanos. But the best correction at the time of this filming, I gotta give to, well, this, is, this is the first time this has ever happened, but I gotta do it. It goes to Giggity Guy once again, who says, but some of the other physics in the game really don't make sense. In the game, the moon always appears to be directly overhead, not moving in the sky at all. If the moon just literally stopped in place, the planet would continue to rotate underneath it, so it would not remain stationary overhead from our perspective on the ground, but actually cross the sky, much like our sun. In order for it to remain fixed, it would have to actually revolve around the planet at the same rate the planet is rotating, like a geosynchronous satellite, like we said. But geosynchronous satellites orbit a very specific distance to maintain their orbit because they have to be going exact speed to keep up with, rotating, with the rotating planet while balancing the acceleration of gravity as it decreases, you get further away from the center. Our moon is much further away than this geosynchronous distance, and so it would have to actually go much faster than it currently does in order to keep up with the rotating planet. But if we're going at the speeds necessary to match its orbital period to the planet's rotational period, the gravity experiences its orbital distance would actually be too small to hold it in orbit. Instead of falling to the planet's surface, it would go flying off into space. You nailed it. You are a super nerd. Twice. How's that? Now, if you are subscribed to Alpha at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you get the main episodes two days earlier than everyone else's long, along with other stuff. But if you have not subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science, I say it differently every time, is going back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. Just kidding, it's Infinity War. <laughs> yeah, okay, I know, I know. You might be sick of Infinity War right now. I get it. But I'm going back to the topic because I have something very special for you. In this week's episode of Because Science, I'm talking to the single person on the planet who is best equipped to talk about Infinity Gauntlets, I think full stop, to see if you can actually physically snap in something like an Infinity Gauntlet. Could Thanos make the finger and hand motion necessary to accomplish the physics of snapping? It's really cool. It's a little bit different than we normally do, but because we have the expert on Infinity Gauntlets here for the episode, I think you're gonna enjoy it. So stay tuned. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science. If you haven't yet, make sure to leave your comments, questions, and corrections all across all of our channels and properties at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because Science and <laughs> at, see, I did it intentionally. And at Because Science on Instagram and Twitter. I'll be checking those locations for all the comments and questions for these episodes. And I also do look at all your suggestions for episodes, and sometimes I make them into full episodes. So uh, lay it on me. Hey, and don't forget, even if your soulmate is one in a million, that still means there's roughly 7,000 people on Earth who are perfect for you. It's almost as if platitudes crumble under the weight of rising population and global travel. It's almost like these th sayings aren't accurate. It's almost like re re reducing human uh, emotion down to one... Uh... If love was one in a million, statistically you could have more than one soulmate. Have fun explaining that to the other one. Or ones. Good luck.